Well, there have been some requests to get back to work on our grill project. I took a little bit of a break from it to do some of the paying orders in the shop and to keep people from getting a little bit too bored working on the same project since not everybody's interested in that. So we're going to keep doing a little here and a little there and trying to keep interesting videos coming out for everybody. But we'll get back to this. We'll do the, the crossbars. They still need holes in them. When we originally laid this out, I laid this out so that these bars could be a little long or a little short if necessary, just because of the way it's going to mount on the window that I envision it going on. So I'm not sold on any particular spacing here as long as it's pretty close to this. That gives me some freedom at this point. If you need to make a project like this that has to fit exactly, you have to do more precise test pieces, practice the technique, and make sure you know exactly what is going to happen. And the reason I bring that up is when I did this, I said I was going to drill the holes. Drilling the holes is quick, it's simple. For a project like this, I think it's more than adequate. It's not going to weaken it significantly. But drilling is not necessarily blacksmithing, and I can understand where people might like to see a more traditional technique used on this. So instead, I've decided to punch the holes. Now, why does that, that matter? Something is going to happen when we punch these holes. The bar may get longer. The bar may get shorter. Maybe it won't change. If you've never done a bunch of punching, you may not know what to expect. You also may not know exactly what to expect on this size bar with a specific size hole and how many punches you're going to use. So you need to do those test pieces if it matters. For this, it doesn't matter. If this shrinks an inch or grows an inch, it still works for my project. So let's not get too hung up on that. But remember that test pieces can be very important. And we're going to compare. We're going to find out what this does. Right now, this piece is 33 and 1 8 inches. So I'm going to write that down. Pays if I don't make a typo when I'm writing with a pencil. And we are going to punch our five holes for our five pickets in this bar. And then we're going to see, did it grow? Did it shrink? Why would it grow or why would it shrink? If you have a square bar and you drill a hole, you remove material. There's no force acting in any direction on this square bar, not horizontally, not vertically, not in and out. But when we punch a hole, we aren't really removing much material. There'll be a little slug that comes out, but not much. So that means this hole, if we punch a hole here of the same size, this is going to swell up and it's going to move around that hole. What direction? We know this is going to go out. But think about what's going to happen here. Is it going to move in? Is it going to suck it in so this can go out? Or is it going to push it out in all four directions? The other consideration is what happens to the side of the bar? What happens in, in this dimension? So we're going to have to look at all that. We'll punch our holes. We'll remeasure the bar. And we'll see what happened. The other thing I considered doing for this project was a slit and drifted holes, which means you chisel a cut and then you upset the bar to open the, the slit that you've just chiseled and then you drive a drift through it to shape it to the final shape. That almost always shrinks the bar, but it also really doesn't lend itself to little holes. You can do it. You can, we did a quarter inch when we did our little corner brackets for the shelf brackets. And if you'd like to see how that was done, you can go back and watch that video. But it's not absolutely necessary for little holes like that. This is going to end up being about a 3 8 inch hole. And I think it's just too much fussing, too much fiddling, too delicate a chisel that's going to get hot and deform and need to be sharpened almost every hole. So I don't think it's worth doing for that. But slitting and drifting is good for stuff like this, where I'm past a 3 quarter inch square bar through another 3 quarter inch square bar. That's a classic use for slit and drift. 
and we will discuss slitting and drifting and how to do a test piece to calculate whether your stock shrinks, whether your stock stretches, what happens when you slit and drift. We will do that as a separate video and I'll try to follow this one up immediately with that video so you can see both methods right off the top. First thing we have to do is lay out for our holes to make sure we're punching right where we want to. When we first did our full size layout for this project, I suggested that you make a hook rule with the layout for everything on it. This has all the information we need. Each picket is laid out and I can make a mark at the center of each picket and then we're going to center punch at each one of these these marks. It's just a matter of leaving a nice deep center punch mark that you can find again. I will actually redo these marks hot So I've really got a good deep mark to line my center or my hole punch on. So this goes in the forge. And this is the punch we'll be using. I think it's one we made as one of the earlier videos. If not, it's very similar to one we made. It's about a quarter inch diameter on the end, but it tapers a lot, so I'm going to end up with more like a three-eighths hole. When we're done, we'll drive a 3 8 drift through each hole to make sure that it really is a 3 8 hole. Now I've got a work stand here. I'm going to set level with the anvil. The first thing I'm going to do is find that center punch mark with another center punch and create a much bigger depression that I can actually find with the nose of the round punch. We're going to drive this through until it starts to bottom out. You may need to cool that a few times. Take two or three heats to do this if you need to. And look for the little target mark left from the cold anvil and the punch and line this up. It's okay if this is cooling off some at this point because you're really shearing, not punching at this stage. Okay, there's our, our punched hole and there's our little slug. So the slug is really quite tiny. The same diameter as the end of the punch and probably only about a sixteenth of an inch thick or less. So we've removed very little material out of our hole. So then we're going to drift through the hole with a three-eighths round drift. is tapered on the end so once it's through it just shoots all the way through. So there's our first hole. You notice it's swelled out here but it does not swell out as much on the other side. And this is actually the side we started. This is the back side. It's, by the time you punch through here it's weaker and therefore it swells out more. Less, less material supporting it. So make sure everything is straight and go on to the next hole. So now we will repeat the same process four more times, starting by center punching. That helps you make sure your punch's center does well. You can really see that divot. And we go to the round punch. This punch is going to need to be sharpened. I can already tell it's getting a little off. let that bar cool down so I'm going to reheat it. It took a moment to dress my punch on the grinder while that was heating. So 
the procedure is just exactly what we used the previous go around. The slug is actually still in there. It's just folded over to the side. So I'll knock it out of there. Then we will find our drift. Now this drift is going to get hot in subsequent heat, so you may not want to pick it up with your bare hands. And there's hole number two. Take time to straighten the bar, but remember you don't want to mess up your freshly punched holes. Go on to hole number three, so we just we're gonna repeat this three, four, five, three more times. Now the center punching I'm doing is really just a bit of insurance. Just helps guarantee that you're really centered. So if you don't want to do it, it's not really required. I think most people probably don't. So here are our two bars. Both have all five holes punched, 3 8 diameter. The bars are essentially the same length, or within an eighth of an inch probably. And the holes line up pretty darn good. So I think our pickets, our vertical bars, will line up nicely. So we're in pretty good shape there. We know we started off 
with 33 and 1 8 inch material. What are we now? We are at 33 and 5 8 Perhaps a hair more on one and a hair less on the other. So that means we grew a half an inch. Just a little bit less than an eighth inch per hole. And that makes sense. A round punch doesn't just exert pressure on the sides of the bar. It has to be pushing out on the ends of the bar. That material's got to go somewhere when you're punching that out. So it's 360 degrees of effect from the punch so the bar has to get a little bit longer. Like I say that does not affect my installation in the least, but it might affect yours and you need to do test pieces to find out what's going to happen. It's essentially forging an entire bar just to test it. It doesn't have to have the corners and the finial on it at that point, but do enough that you know that each hole is going to go this far. If it's just a little over, a little under, you can upset, you can draw out, you can do things to fix that. But if it's a half inch long, this that's, would be a lot of work to try and bring these back to, by a half an inch. But they don't need it for what I'm going to do with it, so they're going to be just fine. There's one other thing I would like to talk to you about today, and that is some new lighting I'm trying out. And I would just like to get an opinion from you down in the comments section which version of the light do you like best? This is something I had ordered before I got a comment the other day, but the comment made it clear that I really needed to do something. And it's mostly that window behind the vise that you see often when I'm working at the anvil that provides glare and is really lousy for videoing, but it's a wonderful window for working at the vise, so I don't want to cover it over with a shade, even though that would make the videos better. So I've added some lights. Right now they are off. Uh, just a few minutes ago, while we were looking at these bars, those lights were on. So compare this with this. Is this any better? With the, I have two lights on. They're at 75% of their overall output. And they have a yellow gel over the screen. Now I've replaced the yellow gel with a clear gel. So this is the whiter output. Or the, the natural daylight version versus the soft white version or the interior lighting type version. So which do you like better? Do you like the clear? Do you like the yellow, which is what we're back to now? Or do you like it without the lights, which is where we are now? Uh, I've had these lights on for most of the video at the anvil, so you may have seen some changes one way or the other there. Hopefully you got an opinion. Put that down in the comments. I think we've talked long enough, so if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Love it if you hit that subscribe button. Remember, ring that bell if you want to know when the video for the drawing comes out in the next few weeks. Get out to the shop, stay safe, do wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.